Hello and welcome to the FII View. This week we have a very special guest with us, Raman Tului, who's uh, the global co-head of Emerging Markets Portfolio Management at PIMCO. He is part of the portfolio management team which oversees over $80 billion dollars in EM strategy. Ramin, it's so good to have you on the show. Thanks very much for taking out the time. No, it's a pleasure to be with you. Okay, Ramin, to my first question. And, you know, in the recent report released by PIMCO, authored by Mohamed El Aryan, uh, the report talks about world markets and economies reaching a T-junction, where one path leads uh, to financial stability and the other to a systemic breakdown. Uh, given the recent comments uh, from the Fed uh, that came out of the Fed minutes, what is the expectation and what is the probability that you ascribe to either of those scenarios playing out? Well, every year at PIMCO, we have this outlook session called the Secular Outlook, where we try to think about the multi-year dynamics that are going to shape asset markets. And in 2009, we talked about a new normal, uh, predicting that industrialized countries would have a multi-year period of very slow growth, um, as they delevered and emerging markets would, would grow more quickly. A key aspect that we discussed in our, recent, uh, in our recent discussions was whether that new normal was sustainable. And in fact, we're seeing uh, more and more tensions with this low growth equilibrium. You're seeing that in terms of socio-political tensions, for example, in Europe. You're seeing that in the uh, you know, currency wars and, and volatility in currency markets. And you're also seeing that in the difficulty that emerging markets are having in maintaining their levels of growth uh, amid this continued weakness in the, in the developed world. And so we think that in the next five years, various parts of the global economy are going to face what might be called a T-junction, where either they'll be able to emerge uh, and generate sort of a self-sustaining, higher growth equilibrium, or they're going to turn the other direction and, uh, and fail to ignite sustainable growth and bringing about the specter of, of haircuts on debt uh, and, and, and exa further exacerbating these various socio-political tensions. Um, you know, right now, I would say that, that we see a, a, a number of weak aspects of the global economy, um, you know, which make the, the risk of this turn to the left one that investors really need to focus on. But Raman, doesn't that bring uh, the issue of timing? Because we've been in this crisis for the last five years. When do we see uh, some sort of clarity on whether or not there's been a fix to the crisis? Well, I think that uh, it's obviously very difficult. The timing aspect is very difficult. Um, I think that people have been surprised by uh, by the, the, sustain, the sustained nature of the, the run-up in asset prices amid these central bank uh, uh, liquidity injections. Um, but I think that now it's getting to the point where some asset classes, and, and I would point out high-yield uh, bonds, global high-yield bonds, for example, the yields, the, the prices have gone up so much, the, the, the yields have come down so much, that now that there are genuine questions about whether those yields offer sufficient compensation for credit risks in an environment where growth is not, has so far not been catalyzed by, by these central bank policies. Raman, while you've spoken about growth being a key indicator and a key fix to this problem, do you think that growth projections will be revised lower, that growth by itself will get into a new normal zone uh, where uh, targets will be revised lower and that will happen perhaps 2014 onwards uh, globally? Well, I think in the near term, what we're looking at is just continued slow pace of global growth. We're probably going to see, you know, roughly 2% growth in the United States this year. Um, we still we have a recession in Europe. We'll probably see more than 2% growth in Japan, thanks to the, the aggressive um, monetary um, and fiscal stimulus. Um, and we'll probably see growth in the 7.5% range in China. So, so rates of growth that are not, they're, they're certainly not apocalyptic, but they're slow. And I think that the key question is, in 2014, uh, you know, are we still going to be in this kind of slow growth muddle through scenario, or can we hand off to something which is a, a higher rate of global growth? Okay, let's discuss uh, the T-junction model uh, that you have come up in your recent report. Now, as per that model, Japan followed by India are in the high-risk, high-return policy regime. Can you explain that view? Well, there's an interesting symmetry, I think, in, in where both Japan and India are right now, which is that the, the future growth outlook is, is heavily dependent upon 
whether the um, whether the economy is whether the the governments can undertake some structural policy reforms. So I mentioned in Japan, the the new policy of Abenomics has th you know a, a couple of different dimensions. One is a policy of cyclical reflation, fiscal and monetary policy, but there is also a dimension of structural reform. Uh, labor market uh, liberalization, product market liberalization, trade integration, and the the resilience of this and the sustainability of this recovery in Japan is really dependent upon whether progress can be made on that on that structural reform. Similarly, in India, there are a range of structural reforms relating to um, the both not only foreign investment but approval of, of domestic investment, reforms in the energy sector, uh, reforms in um, in uh, uh, various aspects of the capital markets regime, and those are ultimately very important for for um, for uh, sustaining growth and and generating growth in India going forward. And so I, I think there is a certain symmetry between the two countries in terms of the importance of structural reform to growth outlook um, going forward. Where do you see the Japan story headed from here, given uh, the efforts made by the central bank and policymakers? of uh, bringing about a change in the economic structure. Do you think that what we're seeing right now in Japan is structural? Well, there are, there are three arrows or three aspects of, of the uh, economic policies of, of Prime Minister Abe. Uh, the first arrow is fiscal policy, second arrow is monetary policy, and the third arrow, um, and these are the, the, the arrows, the, the term uh, that they use, is growth strategy. Um, and what we've seen the most of so far is the first two arrows, particularly the second, the very aggressive asset purchase program of the BOJ, which has, of course, produced a very sharp weakening of the Japanese yen. Now, these first two uh, arrows, the fiscal policy and monetary policy, provide this boost to the, the near-term growth of the economy, and they're going to help boost growth in 2013. But the sustainability and whether we have a handoff in, into uh, sustainable growth in 2014 is really dependent upon what progress can be made on the structural reform agenda. Um, and as I mentioned, that includes labor market reform, it includes um, uh, competition policy, it includes uh, uh, trade integration, um, all of these various aspects which uh, if, if progress is made, can act as a catalyst for uh, greater business confidence and greater confidence among, um, among Japanese households. So the jury is still out um, about whether this set of policies is going to uh, provide the recipe for a, um, an escape from, from deflation. But, but it's very clear to us, in any case, that the, that, that the, the monetary policies themselves may be a necessary component of the, the solution, but are certainly not sufficient uh, in and of themselves. What happens to the yen then? What is your forecast there? I think the Japanese yen is, is going to remain very weak. Uh, we've, obviously, we've, we've had a, a very dramatic move weaker in the yen so far, uh, but we were talking earlier about PIMCO's multi-year secular outlook. I would say that I think the Japanese yen is going to be weaker several years from now than it is than it is at present. And in the near term, uh, this very strong commitment, one might say unrestrained commitment, uh, that the BOJ is trying to signal with respect to um, its, uh, its aggressive use of balance sheet and asset purchases uh, is really giving a green light for people to exit yen-denominated assets. Well, the other aspect that the report highlights is that going forward, politics is going to be very critical for making or marring growth revolution in respective economies. Uh, now, taking India's example, given that, you know, we are really counting down to elections from here on, uh, how do you superimpose that view? Because the expectation broadly on the street is whichever party comes to power will have to have a pro-growth uh, sort of policy. Uh, what do you see the risk then there? Well, I think that uh, I think that there are hopes that that that, that happens, and and when we talk about pro-growth policies, uh, I think it's important to note this isn't pro-growth in the sense of just fiscal expansion, but pro-growth in the sense of some of these reforms that improve the ability, um, uh, you know, to do business in India and 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 generate growth in that in that way. 
So I think that there are, there are hopes uh, among many that, that, that that will materialize no matter what the election uh, result is. I would say that it's not necessarily, I, I would argue, the expectation reflected in financial markets. We have an Indian rupee that's still quite weak, has weakened a lot in the last, um, in the last two years, uh, has moved uh, in recent days, again, to the, the weaker side of uh, the recent range. And so I don't, I don't know that, that financial markets are, are pricing in um, an expectation that that growth agenda is, is, is assured. I think that, that, that that's in a, and it leaves us in a position where if, if no progress is made, we probably have a negative outlook for Indian assets. But if, if progress is made, you have, you have continued upside. The other big question on everybody's mind, uh, Raman, is when does this easy policy scenario end? Are we close uh, to seeing a reversal there? Uh, or do you think there's some more time to go for that? I think the answer to that question is going to depend very heavily on, on the, the stream of economic data that we get, the health of the U.S. economy, the health of the global economy. I think that, that you know, central banks, in particular the Fed, uh, have a, a bias to retain very accommodative, accommodative monetary conditions uh, to protect against an, the economy, the, 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 the recovery in the U.S. economy uh, being stifled, being suffocated. Uh, so I think that we're, that, that the, the Fed is not going to move to aggressively unwind uh, this, mo this monetary stimulus until there are more signs about the sustainability of the U.S. economic recovery. I guess that's a way of saying that I think that the, that the risk of a, a premature draining or withdrawal of, um, of these accommodative policies, that the risk of that um, is, is lowered by the, the philosophical orientation of Chairman Bernanke and many other members of the FOMC. You know, at the end of the day, it all boils down to money-making opportunities given the global economic scenario. So what are your top three investment calls when it comes to the Asia-Pacific region? Well, three things I would highlight. I think in currencies, uh, our favorite uh, investment is to be a long a combination of the Chinese renmi, renminbi and the Indian rupee against underweight uh, the Japanese yen. And the, the, the long side of that trade for rupee and for uh, renminbi, actually, the, the logic of those is a little bit different. The, the Chinese currency is a low volatility currency with a yield of about 2%. So we think that that is a good, uh, a, a good way of harvesting a 2% yield at relatively low volatility in a currency we think is very unlikely to depreciate against the U.S. dollar. In the case of India, you definitely have a currency that's more volatile, but is rewarding investors with a yield of about 6%. Uh, so uh, we think the combination of those uh, held against uh, the Japanese yen, which we think is going to continue to be subject to, uh, to uh, depreciation pressure, uh, is a good idea on the, uh, on the currency side. The second category is in, in credit. Uh, we like to hold the higher quality investment grade credits in Asia against higher yielding Asian credits that we think are vulnerable to, uh, to the, this first force that I mentioned, which is weaker global economic fundamentals. We've had risk assets across the board uh, uh, rally very sharply in the face of the, the, the wave of central bank liquidity, and we think some high yield bonds um, have, have gone too far in terms of their existing yields not offering sufficient compensation for the fundamentals of a weak global economic outlook. The third thing I would mention is for global portfolios, um, an exposure to um, a, a diversified basket of, of Asian exposure, both local currency bonds and, and credit bonds. And I say that because currently Asian assets reflect a very small portion of many global investors' portfolios, particularly bond portfolios. And we've seen in the last couple of years some very important sovereign investors seek to remedy this lopsided allocation to developed markets and move into uh, emerging markets generally and Asian markets in particular. And we think that's going to be a continued uh, trend 
that we see in, in global asset markets in the coming years. So, so having that for a, 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 a global investor that has a diversified portfolio, increasing the amount of Asian fixed income. Well, let's talk about your outlook at India. Now, what do you expect in terms of measures uh, that could perhaps enhance or bring about further participation from funds such as yourself into India? Well, I think that there are a number of things that the, that the government can do. I think that you know, there have been discussions about the, um, you know, the quota regime, the FIII regime, the uh, treatment of withholding taxes on fixed income investment. I think one thing that's also very important is just streamlining the ability to uh, establish funds to invest onshore in India. Um, that uh, currently the, the regulatory processes uh, definitely have scope to be streamlined and that would uh, help India by attracting more investment, more capital um, to help lower um, the, um, you know, the cost of funding for both Indian uh, sovereign and also Indian companies. And so I think that in the, you know, in the coming year, we're going to see progress on various elements of this um, because I think that the, that the Indian authorities are serious about trying to uh, expand foreigner access and, and incentivize more foreign investment in the Indian onshore market. Raman, now you have exposure to Indian government bonds uh, in some of your EM portfolios. Uh, what is uh, the expectation on return there, given your outlook on interest rates? And also, uh, you know, would the recent permission to FIS to hedge uh, their exposure make such an investment extremely attractive? Yes, I think that the more flexibility that you, you have for foreign investors to, to manage their exposures and, and manage their rate exposures versus their currency exposures increases the, attra the attractiveness of a market. Right now, I think of the, the, primary, um, the, the primary return from uh, Indian markets is really be, being driven by sort of the yields from, that you get from investing in the currency. So the currency... Um, in, in, you know, you're talking about yields of about 6%. Uh, you, you get some additional yield um, from going out extending duration, but the Indian yield curve is, is quite flat. And the 6% incidentally is on non-deliverable forward contracts, not the forward um, onshore deliverable forwards in India. Uh, so I think that the, you know, the pro from, our, from our point of view, the primary return that you'll get um, will be from uh, from the yield, not necessarily uh, or coupon, not necessarily from the yield compression, um, and of course the, those returns on longer dated Indian bonds are going to be heavily influenced by what happens in global yield markets, as we've seen in recent days. The movements in U.S. Treasury yields have had an impact throughout the world on on government bond yields. And so the, the return profile for longer dated government bonds is going to be uh, heavily dependent on what happens in core duration markets. But what is the region specific outlook there? Because if the expectation is that there are going to be more rate cuts, then wouldn't that get reflected in falling yields? That's right. But to an extent, that's reflected already in the shape of the yield curve. You know, a flat, normally you have more of an upward slope in a yield curve reflecting some term premium. Um, so when you see a very flat yield curve, that typically is, is you know, and the, and the lack of a visible term premium, that means that there is a term premium, it's just hidden. It's hidden within the curve actually expecting interest rate cuts. So the key for a bond manager is to try to, as we say, outperform the forwards, outperform what is actually embedded in uh, in the in the uh, yield curve in terms of expectations of of interest rate hikes or cuts. Do you expect more rate cuts in India then? I mean, I think with the decline in in inflation, uh, you know, the big decline in inflation since since last year, I, I think that that the rate cuts are on the table in a way that um, you know that they that they probably wouldn't have been otherwise. So I think that the you know that the the that the RBI has signaled um, that that um, a, a, a rate cut in the con in the in the context of continuing low low inflation is definitely a possibility. Raman, recently the IMF chief uh, suggested that India should consider a sovereign bond issue. Do you advocate that view too? Well, I think that's you know that's really a decision for the the policymakers in India to make. I think that that. 
you know, when, when we as in investors are looking at any bond issue, whether it's a company or a country, we always want to know what is the rationale for it. Is it, um, you know, what are the funds going to be used for? Is there a market development rationale? Um, and so I know that those issues are being debated within India, um, and you know, that ultimately is going to be a decision that, that Indian policymakers make. For Raman, uh, on that subject, opinion is divided. While one camp believes it opens the window for potential flows to the tune of 15 to 20 billion dollars into India, the other camp questions if India can afford an issue like this, given that the quality of forex reserves is primarily dominated by short-term flows and sustainable capital, which can be used for repayment at a later date. How do you see this issue, and do you think that the RBI is being cautious or practical with regards to its view on the subject? I think the trend that we've seen in emerging markets in the last 15 years has been to try to cultivate and deepen the onshore local markets. Um, and the reason for that is very important, which is that historically when emerging markets borrowed uh, in foreign currencies, borrowed from abroad, that left them vulnerable in, in during episodes of currency depreciation because the burden of that dollar-denominated debt increased. And so the, the real revolution that we've seen in the emerging markets bond world in the last 15 years, um, 10 years, has been a, a shift away from uh, large-scale issuance of external debt by sovereigns and instead a focus on cultivating the local market, both for local investors and also for foreign investors. And I think that that is... That is a, a, a very good objective for countries to, to have in the long term, uh, or I should say for the long term. Um, having a, a deep local market that provides financing for the government and for companies in the local currency at progressively longer and longer maturities uh, is something that helps stabilize a country during periods of, of ec global economic volatility. Um, and, and therefore, I think that this development of the onshore market is, uh, is certainly it's been a trend across emerging markets. I think it's been a trend that has strengthened emerging markets uh, as an asset class. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that, uh, that, that that benefit of developing the local market in India uh, and the focus on developing the local market of India is kind of motivated by similar considerations. And finally, Raman, uh, what's your view on India as an investment opportunity? Do you think that India is at a T-junction of its own, given the political and macro risks it faces? Yeah, I think, I think India is in a T-junction of sorts. I think that when we look across the, the globe, we see different economies that have policy choices to make, and, and their economies can go down one of two paths. In some places, like peripheral Europe, that's a very stark T junction. I think that for India, um, you know, the capacity to continue rolling at the continued pace uh, is is there probably in uh, in greater measure than it is in peripheral Europe. So so that T junction is not as hard a one. But I think that India is facing uh, some important choices uh, between trying to establish itself at a higher growth equilibrium that would, you know, that would be that would accompany um, um, a more uh, aggressive reform agenda versus a lower growth equilibrium, which would which would represent a, 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 a failure to make progress on that agenda. And so it is a T junction of sorts, but not not uh, of it, the 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 journey to that T junction is perhaps a bit longer uh, than in other parts of the world, and, uh, and maybe the, the, the alternative turns are not as severe. Well, Raman, this was your first interview to an Indian Business Channel, so thanks very much for taking out the time and speaking with us.